So what am I going to talk about today? Um, we've only got a couple of newbies in the audience, um, but uh, I am going to go over the male pelvic floor muscles, um, some lower urinary tract symptoms. Now we call them LUTs for short, L-U-T-S, lower urinary tract symptoms. So if I forget and say LUTs, you'll know what I'm talking about. A bit about erectile dysfunction and some about bowel symptoms. Um, and more than anything, I want to uh, share with you the outcomes of the study that uh, we did together um, two or three years ago now. It's a long time to gather the data and then collate it and talk to statisticians and all this sort of thing. So this group was actually in the study um, and uh, there were 34 other support groups. So I can give you a snapshot view um, of uh, what a prostate cancer support group actually looks like without divulging any personal information whatsoever. So these are what LUTs are. So if any of you have got one or two or three of them, um, you've got frequency. So most men are, compared to women, camels. They wee about four times a day and maybe once at night, whereas women wee about eight times a day. Uh, and uh, urgency is the knee-crossing, eye-watering desire to pee. Now, every single one of you gets the urge to go to the toilet. You don't go to the toilet unless you feel the urge. So we're not talking about normal urge here, we're talking about urgency, which is nasty. And people don't uh, like it and it's very hard to live with. Now, nocturia is getting out of bed more than, well, getting out of bed at night. They used to say more than once, but the International Continent Society now says that getting out of bed at all is called nocturia. Um, I get up oh, twice a night, um, and, some, and then if you count the 6.31 in the morning, I suppose that's three times. So uh, once you're over the age of 65, you're allowed to get out of bed once a night. But some people are getting out of bed four and five times a night, um, which really does impact on your quality of life because it makes you sleepy. Now, hesitancy. This is when you pee in hiccups, okay? Or you can't get started. Once you do get started, it comes in dribs and drabs. And a lot of you guys would have had this symptom before you had your treatment. Um, uh, not so much now. Intermittent stream, terminal dribble is when it just takes forever to actually strop, okay? Now that's quite t different to after dribble. Now after dribble is um, no matter how I dance and jig, the last three drops goes down my leg, okay? So you stand there and you shake the old fella, put him away, walk outside and always um, you get this spot on the front of your trousers. So, this is a really common problem in guys who've got no prostate problems at all. Something like 50% of Australian men have this problem. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And last but not least, I'm going to talk about urinary incontinence. And we're also going to talk about bowel dysfunction because that's really, really important. So I've spent 35 years of my life um, spruiking about female pelvic floor um, issues and when I started to look into the issues related to male continence um, it was a completely different picture whatsoever um, and I really had to start from the basic scratch from the anatomy and work upwards because men's pelvic floor has got very little to do um, with uh, the anatomy that females have. Now this is an interesting um, diagram here this, the green lines is nocturia, the blue line is incomplete emptying, so feeling that you haven't finished your wee properly. And the red line is urge incontinence, this is stress incontinence. Now these weren't men who'd had any prostate cancer treatment at all. This is just the symptoms of LUTs that change in men over time. And I believe this is God's answer to pregnancy, childbirth and the menopause. I mean, you can't get away with having nothing, guys. It's not fair. So um, you can see here, these were 50 to 55, 60 to 65, 70 to 75. So it's normal for um, men to have these symptoms get worse with age. And this here's nocturia here. It's really 70% or 75% of men in the older age group have nocturia. So these symptoms are going to get worse as you get older, whether or not you have prostate cancer treatment. Okay, so you, that's the first thing you've got to remember. So part of this is because you're aging. Um, and I'll show you some other slides that relate back to this very shortly. Now the other thing is 
that men have got this combination of bladder dysfunction. They've got an overactive bladder, which gives them urgency, frequency, nocturia, and urging continence. And they've got bladder outlet obstruction. Now, very few women have this. Um, but this is what happens when your prostate swells um, and causes a blockage. Some of you have had strictures after you've had surgery. Um, and this is, this is when you get hesitancy, weak stream, straining, and dribbling. So this is how come you have these two separate groups of symptoms because they're caused by different particular things. Now, the first thing you've got to remember is that the bladder is a big muscle. It's like the heart. When you wee, it doesn't run out, it's pushed. Um, and so the bladder is a muscular sac. Um, this area here, the trigone, is the most sensitive part of the bladder. And the most sensation cells are right here. Now, where does the prostate press when it swells? Where does the surgeon cut through? <laughs> Okay, so it's no um, surprise that you guys are having problems with the sensation of urgency because I call it the wee spot, the little spot there where there's this really high concentration of sensory nerve endings. And the bladder neck is vital for continence. The bladder neck has to be high and dry uh, for sensation and all the reflexes that help you control going to the toilet. Now this is again just a picture to show you about the sphincters. Now men have an internal sphincter. Now see this little lump here? That's what I call the wee spot. Um, the internal sphincter here is to stop the ejaculate going up into the bladder because when you're uh, um, in childbearing mode, the ejaculate's got to come down and out. So a lot of guys after the surgery will actually have like a dry orgasm because the ejaculate is going up into the bladder because this uh, internal sphincter won't be functioning properly anymore. These are the pelvic floor muscles here. And inside the urethra, part of the tube, is the external sphincter. Okay, now these are separate. And now this works, but very few, rarely do men use the pelvic floor muscles for continence. They don't need to because of this extra little bit of flesh called the penis. And we'll give you two inches, okay? But that extra little bit of tube there, the women's, women's urethra finishes here. Men have got this extra length, which really, really helps to keep them dry. So they don't rely on their sphincters very much until they have to. So these are the male pelvic floor muscles. They're quite complex. This is what they look like when we look at MRI studies. You can see here um, the, uh, the support here. This is the big muscle here going through to the base of the penis. Um, very complex muscles, but if we draw them, they look a bit like this. And they are part of the anus and they support the bladder, okay? This is actually a very bad drawing because they go under here like this. They don't sit above the prostate, they sit underneath it, so. But this is very complex for people to understand. Um, but these are the suspensory ligaments here. And uh, it's interesting, this muscle here is the lower tummy muscles. So when you're doing your pelvic floor exercises, um, you know, often use the lower tummy muscles as well. And the scrotum lifts up and that's the picture of why the scrotum lifts up. Can you see the muscle here? I call it the walnut muscle. I've got grandsons. I have two sons and eight grandsons, so I'm very familiar with the walnut muscle. Uh, so when little boys have got no knickers on, <laughs> their scrotum looks like a walnut with the, the seam down the middle of it, for, for what that's worth. <laughs> so how do the pelvic floor muscles help with continence? Well, this is a complicated... Um, diagram but it cut, goes through the bladder here and through the prostate. Can you see the the way we're looking at this picture? It sliced through the prostate this way. Okay so this is the bladder here, this is the prostate and this is what we call the levator ani which is a big pelvic floor muscle and this is the muscle that's um, it's thickened at the bottom end down here closest to the urethra. It's the muscle that's actually the quick stop um, muscle when you need to stop yourself peeing in a hurry or if you stand at the toilet try and stop yourself peeing, this is the muscle that you're using. Um, and you can see it is thickened down here. Can you imagine what happens when it gets shorter, when it shortens? What do you think might happen? It's going to lift the bladder up. Okay, and when it lifts the bladder up, this stays down here, so it stretches this tube. Now, if you stretch a tube, you're going to increase the pressure inside it. Okay, it's 
pressure and volume and every every engineer in the room is nodding they know exactly what I'm talking about Boyle's law so if you uh, it's like Chinese finger puzzle you put your fingers in each end and pull and you can't get your fingers out well the same thing happens here so the lift of the pelvic floor muscles is really really important so they lift and elongate the urethra and they help the sphincter to squeeze at the bottom okay so they lift and they squeeze they don't just do one or the other now this I use this diagram because I want you to be very aware of the close proximity of these pelvic floor muscles here wrapped around the urethra and then folding right back down into the anal sphincter here at the back they're all part and parcel of the same thing and this is the nerve that nerve to the wedding tackle okay just one there's not a whole lot of them so you just need to be aware of these now the guy surgeon's got to come in here he's got to shell this out without damaging any of those and the fact that they're even trying is pretty amazing um, they are succeeding every now and then but not brilliantly but that's okay they're trying and we've got to give them um, credit for trying now the external sphincter here this is the front view the back view so you can see it's a horseshoe shape so it wraps around from the front to the back okay and the pelvic floor muscles pull in the opposite direction so you get this sort of horseshoe kinking effect when they're all working together now I talked to you about no matter how I dance and jig the last three drops goes down my leg well that's caused by this it's called a patulous urethra and this is just the urethra gets saggy okay now you just get a little bit of urine caught in this S bend literally just like the S bend under your sink um, and it doesn't matter how much you shake the old fella, it's not going to make any difference. The only thing that's going to get rid of that is if you lift this up. So if you do a big pelvic floor squeeze and lift, those last three drops will go into the urinal and you won't have them on the front of your trousers. See, if women leak, it's sort of hidden <laughs> because it's down between the legs and you can wear a pad and even you can wear black shorts, black slacks, nobody will know. But if it's down here on the front of your trousers, there's nothing much you can do about it so surgery what happens with surgery well surgery can affect the bladder neck and remember i told you how important the bladder neck was has lots and lots of nerve endings and it actually tells the bladder when to start and when to stop um, causes a lot of urgency surgery can affect the nerve supply now here's another picture here showing you how complex this nerve supply is here's the little prostate he's got to come in here get all this stuff out of the way and i like to think of it as you know those mandarins you get with the big soft, the skin that's got plenty of room in between them and you peel the skin off and there's all this white thready stuff. That's what this is like. It's not individual, you know, layers of stuff and you can just get it out of the way. It's really, really intricately um, joined together. Surgery actually shortens the urethra and from my travels around to the, uh, to the, to the the prostate cancer groups the guys with radiation therapy tell me that radiation therapy shortens the the penis as well and uh, talking to a lot of the guys they were telling me about um, having almost having an innie instead of an outie a uh, penis that really does not stand out from the abdominal wall makes it awfully hard because as one guy said to me Pauline I can't make it if I stand up I hit the floor if I sit down I hit the floor um, he said, I'm really lost, I don't know what to do about it. And a lot of the guys were nodding, yeah, 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 this is a problem. So the easy way around that was um, cut the end off a drink bottle, the, the bottom, not the top, and pat it. And just put that over the old fellow and you'll give yourself an extra couple of inches so you can actually make it to the toilet standing up. It's little things like this that make a difference to guys. No guy's going to say to his doctor, oh, look, I'm sorry, my, I just can't pull my penis out anymore. Um, and so somebody's got to bring it up and say to them, look, if you've got a problem with your penis, size does matter when you're trying to pee. Um, <laughs> if, even if it doesn't matter at any other time, it matters when you've got to pee. And so um, it's important to understand that um, we are aware of these things, not many doctors are, because the, the, the patients, the men don't say, to the, they don't tell the, the doctors what the real problems are. So when you knock out the, uh, the sphincters with the surgery, the only thing that's left to help is pelvic floor muscles. Now these are the, um, the gold seeds that have been put into the prostate to show the radiation, the, the radiation uh, th therapists where they have to aim the, 
um, the radiation beams when that's the sort of treatment that you're having. And so they've come a long way with the radiation therapy, an enormous way um, compared to what they were even 10 years ago. Um, it's really hard when you do research, you write a paper, for example, I've got a lot of this data now about this study, I write a paper, it might take me three months to get it accepted by a journal, then the journal may not publish it for another six months. So, you know, when you're looking at the information about radiation therapy and how good it is, um, you know, <laughs> they may have made wonderful leaps and bounds that you don't even know about yet because it hasn't hit the literature. But from what we can see here, um, and this was all I could get hold of, I took this picture and I transposed it onto here. So the pelvic floor muscles are getting a whack. Um, now we'll be looking at this um, at Calvary Mater Newcastle, we'll be looking at how much of a whack these guys are getting because nobody in the whole world has looked at that. But interestingly enough, this is the whack we're interested in here too. That's the bowel wall. And that's, you know, getting pretty close to um, the, uh, the plexus that actually helps the bowel to function properly. So I think the bowel is a place, I mean if men have trouble talking to their doctors about leaking urine and having uh, penises that are in instead of out, there's no way they're going to say I can't control my back passage. Okay, um, so uh, it's uh, something you guys have got to come to terms with. But I'll just show you this picture again. Okay, we're looking at here. Here, nerve supply. Okay, so um, we're not sure what's happening there. So we're going to have a little bit of a look now at radiation treatment on bladder control and bowel control. Now this is the pelvic floor muscles here at rest. So you're sitting here and this is the only muscle that never goes to sleep. Even in the middle of the night your anal sphincter is going keeping you continent. I know the Labor Party would like to know that they are the sentinels of social security but it's not. It's actually the anal sphincter, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but each and every one of you could be incontinent of urine. Some of you probably are. You're sitting here. We don't know. But if one of you was incontinent of feces, we would all know. So this really is had the social implications of poor bowel control, uh, something that most people don't uh, put enough effort into thinking about. So you can see here, this is at rest. When you squeeze and lift, you really shut that bowel off. Um, and you squeeze whatever's in here you squeeze it back up um, and then you forget about it for a couple of hours. <laughs> um, if you've got really good bowel function, um, you can do that. Um, but the longer you squeeze it up there and hold it up there, the more like Anzac biscuits it becomes. We would much rather you poo sponge cake, okay? Because this is like an oven and it dries everything out. So the longer you leave it sitting in the oven, the drier it's gonna be and the harder it's going to be to, to poo out. So this is emptying. These muscles have to relax completely so that the pressure from above can allow the faeces to come out, but it has to be well supported. So it's quite complex, it's not straightforward at all. Now, <laughs> when I started asking the guys about wind control, they, they, just, they just said, well, I've always let it rip free, you know, isn't it gonna kill me? So I used to say to them, look, you've just um, sat down in a restaurant, Elle McPherson, is at the next table and you've got a really bad wind. What do you do with it? And they'll say, oh yes, I can hold it in. But you've actually got to convince them that there are times in their lives that they are meant to hold in their wind because they all just think you let it go. So poor wind control can be quite um, a problem. Um, and, and bowel symptoms, now this is called fecal urgency. So fecal urgency is when when you get the call to stool, you need to use your bowels. That comes from the faeces coming down and it sits on the internal anal sphincter. Now immediately that happens, your external anal sphincter squeezes up and you can decide, oh okay, I'm just gonna go to the toilet now. And your external anal sphincter holds it till you get there, then it relaxes. No, I'm sitting listening to Pauline Shirelli and I don't wanna leave, so I'm just gonna squeeze it up and it'll go away. If your external anal sphincter is not working properly, you can't hold on properly till you get to the toilet. You have to go immediately. And that's what faecal urgency is. It's not necessarily diarrhea. Um, it can be faecal urgency with well-formed stool. But if you haven't got that purse string to shut it off underneath, 
you're going to think, oh, oh, here, I've got to go to the toilet. I've got to go immediately. Sorry, hang up the phone, can't wait. Um, and this is something a lot of women who've had vaginal deliveries uh, actually have uh, faecal urgency. And of course, the worst thing after that is actual faecal incontinence where you don't make it to the toilet on time. So, ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, hormone therapy. Um, how does that affect LUTs? Well, the whole reason that um, androgen deprivation works is because it attacks those tissues that make men, men. Now, the strongest woman in this audience is not as strong as the weakest man in this audience. So even if we took the oldest man in the room and said, come out here and squeeze this uh, against a young, healthy, younger, healthy female, no comparison. And what does that? What gives men the muscle strength? Testosterone. It's the most dangerous chemical known to man. It causes wars, car crashes, motorbikes, fights, all sorts of things. That's why women don't have it. Okay? Women, well, they do actually, but it's tempered with the good uh, hormone estrogen. When women have breast cancer, they have to go on tamoxifen. What does tamoxifen do? Knocks out the female hormones because that's, that's why we've got breasts. So that's what happens when you go on ADT. And uh, it really um, reduces muscle strength all over the body, but specifically, and nobody's given this any attention at all, um, the external sphincter, the pelvic floor, and the anal sphincter. Okay, so we've got exercise physiologists around the country making these men do all sorts of exercises when in actual fact they might be leaking. So we do know that these exercises, these problems with the decreased um, muscle power can actually be fixed by exercise. There's a lot of studies that show exercise works. It makes a big difference. So it's well worth um, looking at it, but nobody has actually um, uh, looked at uh, uh, trying to do specific pelvic floor muscle exercises. They're doing this, the man plan does this, the man plan does this, doesn't do this. Because exercise physiologists don't specifically know about the pelvic floor um, and we really need to um, get them involved. But I have to prove that it makes a difference. So that's what I'm doing at the moment uh, at Calvary Mata. Um, we've got groups of men and some of them are going into this special exercise plan um, and some of them aren't. But at the end, the men who aren't will be given the exercise plan just for being nice. So is it worth doing pelvic floor exercises um, and bladder training? Okay, who's this? Arnie Schwarzenegger, then and now. Okay. Does he necessarily have to look like this? It's not inevitable. 75, this guy is. So if you use it, you won't lose it. So thinking about Aunt Ernie, Arnie, if he hadn't been busy trying to be the governor of California and he'd put the same amount of time into his body, he'd still look like this. But aren't they amazing? <sighs> Hope for the future. So what that says is there is a very good reason for older men, any sort of men at any age to exercise. You can still make a difference no matter how old you are. So that's not an excuse. We do know that sometimes when you're on ADT that you feel a bit sick and girls, they have terrible hot flushes. When I ring the guys, because I have to ring some of them to say how they're going, oh my God, he says, terrible hot flushes and I said now you know how your wife feels he said yes he said I've developed an amazing respect for my wife <laughs> so a little bit of talk about erectile function in the pelvic floor muscles you have to realize that women have exactly the same muscles here these are the superficial pelvic floor muscles look at this big fella here he wraps around the base of the penis just like a hand and he does the same job as a hand would do only better okay uh, it's called the bulbo cavernosus um, and he's got a really, really important role because he pumps the penis full of blood and he keeps the penis full of blood during intercourse. So it stops the, uh, um, and apart from that, it actually pumps during the ejaculation and pumps the, the, um, the thing out. And of course, it will help to empty the bulbo urethra. So this is one of the muscles. We'll go back and have another look. This fellow here, he's the one that's going to help you get rid of those last three drops that always goes down your trouser leg. Okay. 
Again, let's have another look. There's the not huge amounts of nerves going down here, look. There's not too many of them and there's the prostate there. So trying to miss out is really bad. So in a nutshell, pelvic floor exercises are worth doing. That whatever age you are, that's not an excuse, okay? Um, but you do have to make sure you're doing the right thing. I don't know how many times I've had men come to me and say, I'm not doing those pelvic floor exercises, they, they make me worse. And when you check what they're doing, they're actually bearing down instead of squeezing up. Okay, so you really do need to see somebody. If the DVD that I've got doesn't explain to you how to do it and you're not sure you're doing it properly, you can one, try and stop your flow. So do a wee and try and stop it. But you must only do that as a test. It's not an exercise and you mustn't do it repeatedly. It's, I'm just asking you to do it to give you an idea of am I using the right muscles. If you're not sure, get hold of Taryn Katz, say, Taryn, I just want you to show me am I doing the right exercises. You might only have to go for one visit, but it will be very, very worthwhile. You've got to make sure you're doing the right thing and you may actually have to be using your lower tummy muscles as well. Now, I'm not talking about these tummy muscles here. I'm talking about down here where your pubic hair starts. Okay, I want you to pull that part in towards your backbone as you squeeze up your pelvic floor. Okay, right down low here. And it's not a big movement, it's quite a small movement. So one man suggested that I should tell the men to suck their nuts to their guts. And, and in saying that, men would immediately know what you were talking about, okay? I think it sounds terrible, but uh, what's a nice, nice girl like me doing in a place like this? But that's what the guy said, and whenever I say it, you can see the light going on. So, <laughs> so make sure you're doing the right thing. Make sure you're using your tummy muscles as well. And with each squeeze and lift, it has to be as strong and as hard as you can. There's no, Arnie Schwarzenegger didn't get to look like that by going like this. He lifted weights. Now you can't lift weights, well you can if you're a woman, oh, you can if you're a man, but we won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> you've got to do a big, hard, strong cough and that's the way you make these muscles work. So you squeeze up really hard and <coughs> cough, squeeze up really hard and <coughs> cough because that's actually making those muscles work harder. Now if I'm to say to you, squeeze up really hard, so one, two, three, squeeze, now more, more. More! And every time we do that, you pull in extra muscle fibres and that's what helps the muscle to strengthen. So you've got to try and make yourself go up hard and then more, more, more. Okay, so it's got to be hard and strong. Now you've got to try and hold them for about 10 seconds. Now when you start off, you might only be able to do that for three seconds. That's okay. Do it as hard as you can for three seconds, but you're trying to work towards 10. Okay, you need 10 seconds for the anal sphincter to be able to get you to the toilet. Okay, so before I move on to the study, who's got some questions actually about the pelvic floor and pelvic floor exercises? Just a question on, uh, uh, you mentioned there, uh, if you had ADT, it causes weakness and presumably you end up with some problems with your pelvic floor. Is that then reversible if you, if you stop ADT and you're then able to... Um it's even reversible while you're having ADT. That's the message that I'm trying to get out. Right. That's the study that I'm doing at the moment. And what I'm actually doing in my study is we've got one group of men on ADT doing this very specific pelvic floor exercise program and the other men on ADT just doing the man plan, which is what we call usual care. So we're not stopping them. But you can actually um, work hard while you're on ADT um, and prevent the loss. But of course we don't know how good you were to start with and that's interesting because I'm actually measuring what these guys are like before we start the, the study and it uh, seems to be a bit of bottom problems. There are problems with the bottom line in lots of men. Mm. That was a very good question. Uh, I had radiation treatment uh, for the prostate and after a period of time I started to suffer from incontinence. And uh, at one stage I was going to have a uh, what do you call it, the uh, sphincter. sphincter. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was told that I should do the bladder test, which I did, and then it was suggested that uh, 
it may be the bladder could be the problem and or it could be the sphincter, but it could be both. So I did the dynamic test on the bladder and it was shown that the bladder not only had a little sac in it, which may be something different to what you said where it was holding urine, but um, that I should have Botox treatment. Mm -hmm. Now I've had that three weeks ago, so I've got another week to go before they say that it starts to take effect. Have you had any experience where people have had the Botox treatment and for what women, happens afterwards? Yes. Women, um, uh, Botox treatment for women has, uh, is, they've been using Botox for uh, some while now in women. Um, it does work, but it tends not to last. Yeah, it doesn't always work, but when it does, uh, it tends not to last. But bladder urgency is, um, bladder urgency is um, a, a big problem um, and you sometimes when you have radiation therapy you do get a bit of fibrosis which is one of the other things I'm interested in in my study we know when we're treating women who've had breast cancer that they've got to keep exercising for at least three months after the radiation therapy because that's how long it takes for the fibrosis to finish so um, that's one of the things that we'll be looking at with the men so yes Botox um, is uh, useful in some people, for sure. I've got a question on this side, right? <laughs> the, 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 pel <clears throat> the pelvic floor exercise that you've just described, <clears throat> is, that, um, uh, is that effective for the, uh, the anal sphincter as well as for urinary? Same, same exercise. It's, it's really, really incredible. Uh, I mean, I've just had to write a book for this study, had to develop this booklet. Um, and to try and get the men interested, you know, you have to think about if the guys don't have any urinary problems but they've only got bowel problems or if they've only got erectile problems but none of the others. So I just want you to do a little thing for me now, guys, okay? I want you to think that um, Elle McPherson's just walked into the room and you've got really stinky wind, okay? So close your eyes and squeeze up tight to hold in that wind. Really hard, hard, hard and relax. Okay. Now I want you to think you've just had four schooners and you've driven down the F3 and you're busting to pee, okay? So I want you to hold on to your wee. Hold on, hold on, hold on, and let go. Now I want you to think about pumping the old fella full of blood, okay? I want you to get an erection, okay? I want you to pump, pump, pump. Now you tell me, are you using different parts of the muscle? every single one of those you're using a different part of the muscle but it's the same muscle you can't use one part without the other but you can change the focus um, and so this is something that's come to light as far as I'm concerned but I don't think there are any studies that look at this but we've got a thing called the motor cortex and you know really the anal sphincter has quite a big area on the motor cortex in the brain because anal sphincter control is so important. So yes, that was a great question. It's the same muscle, but you're funneling in with a different emphasis, okay? So, uh, but that was a really good question. And I've had to sort of put that into words with no more than two syllables. Uh, it wasn't easy, so, uh, but if the booklet proves to be a success, then we'll probably make sure that it gets expanded further. Pauline, why don't you um, tell the audience uh how you um, helped me uh, st stop the dribble at the urinal. <laughs> it, it's, yes, I, I mean, it, it was incredible. Only a couple of years ago did I realise that if I use my pelvic floor exercises the same way as I did to strengthen them, mm. I could stop the dribble at the urinal. Yeah, absolutely. It's not difficult. Um, the whole thing is that you've got to not turn on your big bum muscles. Your bottom muscles are the biggest muscles in the body. So do you all want to stand up for me now? Okay, now what we need to do is, if we stand like this, and I say to you, okay guys, I want you to breathe in, and as you breathe out, I want you to squeeze up your pelvic floor. So in and on the out breath, squeeze up your pelvic floor, hard, hard, hard. Now think about your bum, and relax. So whose bum was working really, really hard? You've all had training. Yes, yeah, so you've got to turn your bum off so you can concentrate 
on your pelvic floor because your bum muscles are the biggest muscles in the body. So we do that. We take our feet apart, turn your toes in. Okay, now try and make your bum go hard. Okay, so that's an inhibitory position. So now when I say to you, guys, I want you to breathe in. On your out breath, I want you to squeeze your pelvic floor hard, 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 and relax. And you, if there's a movement there, you can actually feel it because you've turned off this great big muscle. So, um, but some of you won't have felt anything, and you're the guys who really need to go and see somebody about uh, how to have it turned on. So how do we turn it on? Uh, well, generally speaking, we use ultrasound now. We just put ultrasound on your tummy um, and get you to do it. You can see the bladder lifting up and down. So do you reckon we've got to the bottom of it? <laughs> Improving your bottom line. The other, I had uh, a radical about 18 months ago. Yep. And I've just finished uh, uh, the radiation treatment as the next step on the uh, prostate bed. So I ended up with some... Uh, radiation burn to the bottom of the bladder and a little bit also in the valve that so that sort of comes into play too yeah as well because that helps that's not what's happening of course is that if you drink a, a bit of, you go about every hour or two it's absolutely sort of, but the thing about it is um you know you do need to be aware that um, if you're having radiation therapy that you need to keep these. We don't know how well the guys can actually cope with these exercises while they're having radiation therapy. That's what this study is looking at. So I'll be able to say to you, look, from our experience, we find the men do not have any problem doing these exercises even after they've got their sore bottom and whatnot. Um, the sore bottom problem isn't anywhere near as bad now as it used to be years ago when it was quite serious. But with the conformal radiation, therapy now they've knocked out a lot of those problems yeah but you've got to keep the exercises going for at least three months because that's how long the fibrosis takes to finish in muscle tissue okay not that the cancer because cancer is living thriving um, cells like the inside of your mouth it's replacing itself all the time well muscle tissues don't do that they take a long time to replace and that's why the effects go on a long time. So what I'm going to talk to you about now is the, the study that we did. So we went, um, I went round with my husband George. George is actually a prostate cancer survivor so he feels quite at home in these groups. Um, <laughs> he doesn't feel the need to join one. He sort of thinks he's joined 31 at this stage. <laughs> so we went all around uh, New South Wales, South East Queensland and right out to Alice Springs. So we've got a good mix of um, groups. We've got rural, urban, metropolitan um, and uh, remote. So we think we've got a good mix here. So there were 31 groups um, and 355 men. So that's where these numbers are coming from. So your average age is 71.5. The youngest guy was 46. The oldest was 97, God bless him. Um, and you can see here the, uh, the, there were far more um, urban clubs than rural clubs, but we still got enough of a mix to, to make the data worthwhile. So 65% of these guys had radicals. 26% um, had um, uh, radiation therapy, 4% had low dose brachy, um, and 5% had high dose brachy. Now, when I wanted to started this study, I thought I was going to do this with just in the men with early stage prostate cancer. Well, when you come to a group like this, um, you can't say to the men, well, look, I'm sorry <laughs> because you don't have early stage um, disease. You, you can't go in my study. I'm not going to help you. So we have all sorts of men in this study. The only guys who didn't um, go into the study were men who recognised that they had very um, advanced condition and they realised that being in the study wasn't going to be of any help. And there was probably two or three in each one of the groups like that. But uh, so 31% of these men have, are having androgen deprivation therapy. And that would mean that some of the men had had surgery, some of them had already had um, uh, brachytherapy that had failed, etc, etc. So that's why the numbers here of ADT looks high, because some men were on ADT 
only. They hadn't had any of the other treatments. So that's why that number looks like that. So most of them had had um, uh, their treatments uh, uh, fairly, uh, fair, you know, after a fair while. Um, but it was interesting that men in the rural support groups were more likely to have had radiation therapy. Now, we can't work that out, but we've checked the numbers three times. Um, we can't uh, work out why. I mean, even in um, Alice Springs, the guys were going to Adelaide or Darwin and having radiation therapy, so uh, obviously they didn't like the thought of the going under the knife. That was interesting. So of the guys who had surgery, 84% had open radical prostatectomies, 14% um, had laparoscopic um, and or robot assisted. We were a bit, some of the figures around that were a bit dicey. Um, but actually 2% didn't know, which was fine. They, we always got to have a don't know, can't remember, especially when you're dealing with people of our age. Mm -hmm. So don't know, can't remember is a very valid uh, amount. So we asked the guys, had they thought that they'd had um, nerve sparing um, or were offered uh, information about nerve sparing um, radical prostatectomy. So 56% of the guys said yes, but only 16% had achieved nerve sparing. So that means they still had erectile function, okay, which is not good. Okay, so what did men tell me about the symptoms? Okay, so there were 355 men um, in 31 groups, so you need to uh, be aware that you sitting there with these symptoms thinking you're the only one who's got them. Now, OAB wet is where they get urgency and they leak. They don't make it to the toilet on time or they have urgency and they wet um, into a pad. Um, so you can see here that 74% of the men in these groups said that they had OAB wet symptoms, urgency with leaking. Um, about 7% of them, it was severe. Um, the, the great majority, it was moderate, but some of them it was quite severe. And that surprised me because most people will tell you that stress incontinence is the most, um, uh, is the most likely um, incontinence that men have after uh, surgery where they lose a leak when they cough or sneeze or you know work in the garden or pick up the grandkids. So uh, um, you know, we were quite surprised about this. So overall, 56% of the men reported stress incontinence. So you can see that there was an overlap um, and had what they call mixed symptoms. So that they're leaking when they cough and sneeze, but they're also leaking when they get um, severe urgency. So 11% of men had severe stress incontinence. Okay, this is interesting. This is other leaking. So this um, to me is guys who've got an open bladder neck. Um, they're just leaking all the time. They might leak when they go from sit to stand. They don't particularly have these symptoms, but 10% um, uh, of them uh, have severe other leaking um, and 50% of them have other leaking anyway. So uh, quite interesting. How about this? 78% of the men in this group reported erectile dysfunction. Now we used a very good, uh, well-validated um, uh, measuring thing here. We have problems with people like priests. <laughs> Do you have, are you capable of incontinence? Well, the priests uh, of intercourse, the priests didn't want to say yes. So they wrote little notes about, we only had two of them, but it was really interesting. But you know, you live and learn so that when I, when we did the next, um, uh, when we're doing the, the study now, we've got a different uh, group of questions so that, uh, uh, you know, because so one lady came up to me and said, darling, it doesn't matter that he doesn't have any erectile function. We haven't had sex for 26 years so uh, you know you have to some men are not interested it doesn't worry them and so you've got to take these things into consideration when you're actually measuring um, these things because for some then it's not particularly a problem but this was interesting looking at the uh, the risk factors here so 12% had other diseases we asked them how their general health was and they had to list the other problems that they had so uh, I think oops this is a very healthy group look at this diabetes only 7%. <laughs> so only 7% of these men were actually under treatment for diabetes, which is interesting. Um, and 36% of men were smokers. Now, this is about erectile dysfunction. What treatments were associated with erectile dysfunction? So the ones in red are the worst ones. So we've got um, radical prostatectomy, uh, but 
then when we come down to these fellows here, you have to remember that the guys with androgen deprivation therapy alone were probably the guys with very advanced um, uh, disease, okay? So you can't look at this and say, oh my God, you know, it's ADT that's doing it. So you've got to be how careful how you interpret this sort of thing. But um, guys with androgen deprivation and uh, radical pr prostatectomy, again, these are guys with fairly advanced disease. I'll use mine. And this was brachytherapy, interestingly enough. Um, w there was a significant group of men who had, had brachytherapy who had erectile dysfunction. And a lot of men have brachytherapy because they're told they won't get any erectile dysfunction. Okay. So... Uh, so when, when, when we can do, you had, uh, what is it, lies, damn lies and statistics, you can do statistical manipulation to allow for things like age and um, all sorts of other things and radical prostatectomy um, and uh, these are the most significant um, things that contribute to erectile dysfunction, radical prostatectomy, uh, surgery and ageing, okay, so it depended whether you were old, uh, the older you were, the more chance there was you were going to have erectile dysfunction, which hello, hello is going to happen to you whether you had radiation therapy or, or um, prostatectomy problems or prostate problems at all, because older men do have erectile dysfunction. Um, but age and radical prostatectomy were the strongest contributing factors. Okay. Now this was interesting. So the men who reported storage LUTs um, were the, like, the ones who were... Uh, with urgency and nocturia, these were the guys more likely to report erectile dysfunction. Okay. Now, we used a bother scale um, and uh, we used it 0 to 10 and you had to put your finger out, you put a cross on the line between 0 to 10, um, how much of a bother was this to you? And you can clearly see here that the men aged under 60 were the ones who had the highest bother level. So men aged 80, <laughs> you can see they're not particularly worried. Okay, so, and I think this is important so that's uh, but it, it's still high for some of the other groups but it was the younger guys that uh, were most affected now the bowel we ask them again we use what we call a validated instrument so we know that when we ask these questions this way we get pretty good answers 16 percent of men leaked solid stool so this is not skid marks this is losing it all okay um 1% daily and 0.6% weekly, 3% sometimes. But that's uh, a pretty nasty number. And they wouldn't, that we were just lucky that they were at the, the meetings because usually men with this problem don't go out. Leaking liquid stools, 8% of men leak liquid stools. 32% of men felt that they didn't have proper control of their wind. Okay, which means going to church, for example, can be fraught with difficulties, especially if you're talking to the pastor's wife. But you don't sit on the pew. <laughs> you have to get a cushion. Yeah. The other interesting thing was I wanted to find out how many men knew about pelvic floor exercises and if they did, how they were taught. Um, and so how well were men taught pelvic floor exercises? Um, you can see most of them were given a pamphlet or a poster. Now, let me tell you, I actually looked at the ability of 58 healthy young physiotherapy, male physiotherapy students, how well could they contract their pelvic floor muscles? 10% of them could not do it at all. Some of them could do it in lying but not in standing. Some of them could do it in standing and some not in lying. So you, you can't just all say, oh, okay, everybody stand up, it's gonna work better that way. It works better for some men in standing better for others in sitting. And for some young healthy men can't do it at all before they've even had any prostate cancer treatment. So the only way you can really make sure is to use ultrasound. Uh, it's like the ultrasound we use for looking at babies. You just put it on the tummy here and you can see the bladder moving up when you do a, uh, a pelvic floor contraction. But you have to get undressed. If, if you go to someone who doesn't take your knickers off, don't pay, just walk away. 
I mean, if they don't want to look at the area that they're treating, um, you're really getting an inferior treatment. I mean, for nothing else, they need to give you a mirror so that you can actually see whether your anal sphincter is puckering up or not. So if they don't have any fancy equipment, they've got a mirror so that they can show you what happens. Now, in one of the instances, I looked at 10 older men who'd had prostate cancer. They could not do any anal squeeze at all unless I touched them on the anal verge with my finger. Once you touch them, up it went. They, they knew exactly what they had to do, but they couldn't do a thing unless you showed them with your finger, you give them tactile biofeedback. So physios are trained to do all this sort of thing. Of all of these guys, only 36% had um, adequate treatment after. But the studies clearly show that uh, men are much better off having adequate instruction before they start any treatment. Um, and so uh, only 22% had had that. Okay, so men are, um, quite a few men are having instructions, but not very many are having proper instructions. We know handing out a piece of paper isn't going to work. So did pelvic floor ex exercises help? Um, with the 42 men, percent of men, 144, who reported doing pelvic floor exercises before their treatment, uh, they were much less likely to have um, uh, lower urinary tract symptoms afterwards. So an odds ratio. Uh, so the odds were about 30% less if they'd done pelvic floor exercises beforehand. Okay, so uh, we did this with the DVD. So uh, we gave out men in the intervention groups actually got a DVD. Some groups got a DVD and the helpline, which was a direct access to me. Any time of the night or day, they could ring me if they had any problems to discuss about the DVD. So did they like the DVD? Um, well, that's a bit out of place, but that's about the contact, the contact, um, the CFA, the Continents Foundation of Australia, because they can give you um, the, uh, if you tell them your postcode, they can tell you which is the physiotherapist nearest to you who will work in this area. They can tell you where the nurse continence advisor is if you need help um, with bladder or bowel containment. But the Continence Foundation of Australia is very, very important. They, and they are, uh, they've got people uh, manning the phones, uh, not 24 seven, but uh, business hours, nine to five, Monday to Friday. And this is one of the reasons that Australia leads the world in continence promotion because of the Continence Foundation. So did they find the DVD useful? Well, one man said it was useless. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, these were percentages here. No, no, these were men. So 99% said that they would recommend it to others, um, but very and extremely useless. The great majority of them found that quite helpful. So we're very, uh, I was very pleased about that. Um, but how many men used the helpline that was available? None. One guy rang me after St. Vincent's to tell me how wonderful the presentation was. <laughs> that was it. Nobody actually used the helpline. And how long did I have that phone for? A year. We paid for it for a year. I carted this phone around with me for a year and nobody used it. So it just goes to show don't waste your money. And that was actually funded by uh, COSA, the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, um, who gave us the money to do that. So uh, there you go. So yes. Uh, well, I actually have got data on why they didn't use it, and that does seem to be uh, most of the most of the reason. So, um, for handout copies of this presentation, uh, we're going to um, have uh, six slides um, per sheet, uh, so that there'll still be quite a few sheets to print out. Uh, I'm going to make that available, um, or if you want a copy of the DVD. Um, this is the email address to contact um, and anybody in the audience who's interested, I've got that to hand out to you so you don't need to write it down now, although Pam's madly writing it down. I'll give her a piece of, I'll give her a copy of the, the little card that we've got. So this is George. I don't have time to handle anything like this. We made the DVD for the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Um, they funded it, uh, so it was done for you and most of the guys have found it helpful. So another round of questions. Yeah, well done, Pauline. You never disappoint. <laughs> so, first question. Jeez, I'm glad it's over this side, Graham. Yeah. And Graham's without a microphone. I might catch up now. Everybody has it. His mouthpiece is here. <laughs> <laughs> Pauline, last time you were here, uh, I'll just preface this remark by saying I was doing Pilates at a gym. Yes. Last time you were here, I was sitting up the back over there, and you said, and to you ladies here, 
If you are doing Pilates, make sure you do it with a physiotherapist, not a gym instructor. I was doing it with the gym instructor and I was getting up at night and I never did. I stopped and I don't. Mm. We, the Continence Foundation, have um, a, a thing called Pelvic Floor First and this is the only place in the world that has it where we've actually got to the fitness industry. We're working with the fitness industry to say these exercises are dangerous. If you've got men or women in your audience who leak and you ask them to do these exercises, they're going to make them worse. So pelvicfloorfirst.com.au, if you know anybody in the fitness industry, they really need to link into that. The last bastion that we have, the last um, barrier that we have to get over um, as far as the Continence Foundation is concerned is the midwives. Um, and uh, we're having uh, the devil's own job getting through to midwives. Um, but that's, uh, that's my quest, uh, <laughs> helping guys who are having radiation therapy and getting young midwives trained so that they know how to help, not the men. Pauline, this over-exercise is, uh, is nothing to be taken lightly. Um, Pam and I, when we're counselling people, we're always telling them to, after uh, surgery or after radiation treatment, to take it easy mm. and not overdo it. What's happening now with robotic assisted surgery is that people are so fixated about how wonderful the hype is that they reckon that they can go back to cycling and do all sorts of things, which is crazy. We speak to so many people who have overdone it on the exercise in the first six weeks after radical surgery or Can I just people. tell you guys that um, as, a, as a physio, we treat sportsmen and cyclists have serious, serious problems with erectile dysfunction. Because the, the nerves uh, wrapping around the, 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 the ischial tuberosities, the sit bones, um, cause erectile dysfunction. They, they, they squeeze the nerves so they can't work anymore. So to actually have surgery and then go sit on a bike, uh, I mean, but the exercise physiologists don't know that. Um, so bicycle riding is not something that's recommended. George has been a bike rider. Um, mind you, he had erectile dysfunction anyway, so we're not particularly worried about the seat, the bike seat, and what it's doing to his wedding tackle. George, do you want to object? <laughs> <laughs> he's fallen off twice, and so now he's got fear of falling, so um, we've got this program to get him back on his bike again. Well, well, as a driver getting frustrated with cyclists, that's making me feel better, actually. <laughs> right. Uh, no, no, you, you need no, this We need the question so that the... The DVDs important to 148 support groups around Australia. Um, someone that has back trouble, like with the, uh, the spine and the spinal cords going into the bladder, is there anything that you can do that can assist with the bladder? Because this, as I've been told by a physiotherapy, this can cause problems with your bladder as well. Absolutely, so that's a really good question. Uh, so much so that men with severe back problems aren't allowed to go in my study because they may in fact um, impact on bladder control. But it needs to be a pretty severe back problem. It would have to be a back problem where you had something like saddle anaesthesia, like the bikies get, um, numbness all around here or... Narrowing of the disc. Yes. Yes, but it would have to pinch on the very specific nerve route that you need. But again, this is another reason for, um, you know, for having a physio help to look at um, the whole man. Because you might, for example, find that you can do pelvic floor exercises in a really strange position, like over on your hands and knees. On the DVD, I actually show a young man doing pelvic floor exercises on his hands and knees. Because when you're on your hands and knees, you're not carrying any body weight at all. So you've got pelvic floor muscles that are um, vertical, not horizontal. Uh, just a minute, I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, if I'm going to the gym, which I do, but I could be doing exercises which could be injurious to the bladder. No, not no. specifically. If they're not, no. if they're no. not hurting your back, they aren't going to hurt no. your bladder no. unless your pelvic floor is very, very weak um, and you're lifting weights. Yes, so you need to be very careful I'm about that. I'm taking credit for that question, Greg. But I'll you talk. can, uh, if you're interested, you could ask your gym person to have a look at pelvic floor first. The oh, well, they need to. I mean, it's now being presented at Filex. So, and they actually, there's a course, an online course, and they can get CPE, uh, you know, on uh, credit for, for doing it. So pelvicfloorfirst.com.au. It's um, wonderful. Brought to you by the government. Uh, <coughs> 
Pauline, there, there was a question earlier about ADT and the effect um, of it wearing off afterwards. Um, does radiation therapy, all, I mean, can the effects of radiation therapy and the fibrosis, um, what happens over time? Well, we know that fibrosis in women who've had breast cancer, and we're working with this muscle here, um, and we know that we've got to keep stretching that um, for at least three months after the radiation therapy finishes. With men, we don't know. That's why I'm doing the study um, at the moment. But looking at what we do know, um, you, there's no reason why you shouldn't use these muscles while you're having your radiation therapy and you definitely should keep them working afterwards. But just how sore that's going to make men, we don't know. That's the sort of thing we'll be exploring with this study we're doing now. We don't want men to be, um, you know, made really, really uncomfortable. What about a time frame afterwards, a year or so after the radiation therapy? Well, I would expect you to, as I say, you must keep it up for three months and uh, we will be studying the impact of this on men at six months and 12 months if we get enough funding. Uh, I'm, I'm getting sick of my wife asking me, have you done your pelvic floor exercises? <laughs> well, how do you think he felt? I used to email him, are you doing them now? Yeah, so yeah, yeah I can appreciate that. But you only have to do, the, the, the thing is, most men think you have to do hundreds and hundreds. We know that all you need to do is six to eight maximal contractions, 10 times, three times a day. So six to eight maximal contractions, I mean, three times a day. Now, if you can link that into, um, and on the DVD you'll see an old fellow with a shopping trolley, and he does squeeze up, lift the luggage, put it in the boot, relax. Squeeze up, lift the shopping, put it in the boot, relax. So it's called having the knack. So if you're leaking, if you've got stress incontinence, and you actually use your pelvic floor muscles before you do the things that are going to make you leak, um, then that's actually exercising. It's part of your exercise program. So you've mm. got to do this forever and ever. Absolutely. Now, look, the guys were telling me, oh, Paul, and I had a radical seven years ago. I was dry for four years. I'm starting to leak now. Hello, I showed you, Arnie. Okay? Your muscles, every one of the muscles in your body is getting older. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So you've got to keep these pelvic floor exercises going for life. Just one f final question about Pilates. Are you ad advocating that people don't do Pilates at all then? No, not at all. Um, what I'm saying is that there are some well-trained Pilates instructors and some not so well-trained Pilates instructors and some Pilates instructors who aren't, uh, aren't trained at all. Okay. So it's the word Pilates that um, uh, you know really does um, make me want to, to say to you, make sure that your Pilates instructor is well-trained. Um, and if you don't, uh, if you've got any questions about that, um, I mean, they'll say, do this exercise because it turns the pelvic floor on. We've now done studies to show that does not happen. There are no specific Pilates exercises that turn the pelvic floor on. You can only turn the pelvic floor on by turning it on, okay? And it needs to be incorporated. But if you've got a good relationship with your Pilates instructor, you should introduce them to pelvic floor first. It's there for them to make sure that they're doing a really good job. Thank you. Very good. Okay, um, Pauline, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks it's, for having uh, me. It's always a great pleasure to have um, young Pauline with us. I think you'll agree that uh, she is um, one of the most, if not the most, practical presenter that we could, um, we could get to address us. And every time we have um, Pauline visitors, and it's quite a few visits now, um, she introduces something that's good for all of us. So. On your behalf, I, uh, I thank Pauline for another very frank, open and excellent presentation. A lot of people around Australia will get great benefit from it. Keep up the good work. We love you. Thank you.